So, um, very happy and fresh morning to all of you. A warm welcome to Euromed webinar program from ISU USI. Hope you and yours are all staying safe in this adverse time of COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, now, without wasting much time, let me introduce you to our faculty for this uh, program. As you are aware that our uh, uh, the Euromed webinar, uh, Euromed program, regular program, we have five modules. Except for one, we have all the four modules here. Uh, we have RIS module, which will be presented by uh, Dr. Tandar Parekh, uh, the PCNL by Dr. Ashish, the laparoscopy by Dr. Ramalingam, and TRP by Dr. Raman Tanwar. And all the faculty have done very well to prepare their presentation, and I am very sure that you won't miss the actual program. It will be very close to the real program. They have uh, done an excellent preparation. Uh, may I now request uh, Dr. Raman Tanwar for his uh, presentation on TRP. Uh, over to you, Dr. Tan Raman. Thank you, uh, sir. Thank you, USI and ISU for the opportunity to be here. I hope I'm audible and, and you can see my screen as well. So starting with the uh, basic learning module for TRP. So most everybody thinks that TURP is an easy surgery. Most residents, they would want to jump into a TURP when given a resectoscope in hand. Uh, but in fact, it is a little trickier. So the aim of this presentation is to be equipped to perform an ideal TURP, which means that it has to be a minimal bleeding TURP, which means that we have to be knowing the anatomy of the prostate and this region. It has to be fast, relatively fast. So we have to know the instrumentation well. We have to know how we have to resect. So the technique of resection has to be clear. And the experience of the surgeon should be good when he does the surgery. He should feel comfortable doing the surgery. So for that, uh, he should understand the technicalities. And there'll be a few suggestions in the presentation. Also, in an ideal TRP, the instrument should not be damaged much. So that is also something that we have to take care. We have to take care of the patient. We have to take care of the surgeon. And we have to also take care of our instruments, which are our bread and butter. So we have to understand the instrumentation and technique. And the, lastly, it should be an uncomplicated TURP or one with minimal complications. So we have to understand the complications. We have to understand the anatomy so that we can avoid these complications. And we have to understand the technique. So presently, uh, the various limitations and the goals are based on the stages of training. So there are a few stages in which the resident should learn the art of TRP. So first is that he will become familiar with the instrument. When he gets the resectoscope for the first time, he will understand, try to understand how it works, what is the resistance of the spring, and various other things, how much the loop travels, so this kind of a familiarity will come in the initial cases. Then there will be an anatomical familiarity. So once he goes inside with the bigger sheet to the resistance of the urethra that the urethra is offering, and what are the what what is the strength of the sphincter? Uh, what is the resistance of the tissue when it is cut? So all these things will he will become familiar with, and then lastly he will develop a muscle memory to be able to perform the procedure in a master. Way. So we can divide it into a few phases, the initial phases that he, the resident will become comfortable with the instrument. He will com become comfortable with the anatomy and he will be able to take a basic chip at the end. In the early phase, basically he will become comfortable with the movement and comfortable with the hemostasis. So that is coming when he does about 10 to 50 cases. And then he will be able to resect either a complete lobe or resect a small prostate in its entirety, maybe leaving the apical part a bit. Then there comes an intermediate phase where even he is done more than 50 cases, then there will be refining in the motor uh, memory for complicated movements that we will talk about. And he'll be, he'll be able to resect an average prostate with some complications. And then there'll be a pro phase when a few hundred cases have been done, where there'll be natural complicated movements with faster resection. He will be mindful of all the complications and he'll be able to resect a larger gland also with minimal complications and most importantly in a planned way. So the structure of learning of this module is 
that basically will be going through the relevant anatomy, the instruments, especially the limitation of the instruments, the, the way we have to take a chip and the techniques of resection, how we plan to remove the prostate, we'll be talking about complications and then some personal suggestions will be there. So coming to the relevant anatomy, uh, we have to understand that the arterial supply of the prostate is quite predictable in the sense that main uh, arteries, as, as we can see in the diagram also, they are at 2 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 5 and 7 o'clock. So superiorly about 1 to 2 o'clock and on the right side of the patient it will be about 10 to 11 o'clock then it will be between 5 o'clock and at 7 o'clock so these we have to control first if we want the TURP to be a little more ideal which means that there is minimal bleeding that happens we have to understand the landmark and uh, of the sphincter, sphincter particularly because anteriorly the sphincter is a little wider so we have to make sure that we uh, uh, ensure a little more margin when we are resecting the apical portions in the anti, uh, in the anterior part of the prostate, and which means the the top mode, the 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock part of the resection. We have to understand the endoscopic anatomy. So starting from the verum montanum to the ureteric orifices, we have to understand how they look, what happens when you resect them, what is the resistance of these tissues, and we should know how to grade the prostate. The usual tissues that we will need are the adenoma which is the prostatic tissue usually it gives a burnt red appearance we will find that some prostates are very fibromuscular they have a fibromuscular hyperplasia so they will be a little different and difficult to cut then we will find the capsule once we have resected the adenoma there will be a pink pliable capsule which will have crisscrossing fine fibers sometimes when we cross the capsule we might find some fat which is a shining yellow loculated apparent tissue and we have to understand what a sphincter fibrosis may look like. It is quite similar to a bladder a muscle circularly running horizontally uh, muscle fiber, which we can see in the picture as well. Uh, of course, we, will, we might meet some tumors. We will be able to identify sometimes the ejaculated drug, especially if it's a, there's a brown lining epithelium by which we can identify it. We can find calculi, hematomas, we can find the corpora coming out, which is a thick, pasty, pinkish like thing coming out occasionally when we remove the glands. And then we have venous sinuses, which basically are poorly controlled with cautery, so that's how we identify them. And then we have arteries, which can be pumpers, and or they may be a requisite bleeding. So all these things, all these tissues we're going to meet. So this is a grading of the prostate enlargement from one of the books that we have written in surgery. Uh, so basically, there is a way by which we can gauge how much time it's going to take by measuring the length of the prostatic urethra. We can see how much the intravesical portion is bulging into the bladder. And based on that, we can make a rough estimate. So if somebody wants to take a picture of the slide, they're most welcome to take the picture of the slide. This is basically from Barnes' original paper with slight modifications. So. So we'll talk about the instrumentation now. What should be on the trolley when we are doing a prostate surgery? The resident should understand that we have always, it's better to keep extra things because Murphy's syndrome comes into play. So basically, uh, we usually require those things which we have not kept. So we have to be prepared for surprises. There could be a medial stenosis, so we need to have a medial dilator or things for a meatoplasty. There could be strictures, so we need to have everything for an optical urethrotomy. It could just be a bladder neck contracture end of the day, so a Collins knife. It could be a bladder stone like the one which we found here. There could be tumors. If the urethra is too long, we have to be prepared for a pineal urethrostomy. So we have to think beyond the prostate also. The other differential diagnosis should also be covered when we prepare our trolley. Then we would talk about the sheets, operators, working elements, uh, what diameter they should be, what cautery, loops, and chips. So each of them we'll take care of. So coming to the instruments recommendation, so which sheets should the resident use? So now we are using the continuous rotating type of sheet. So in this kind of sheet, I would just want to uh, stop sharing the screen and I would give a physical demonstration of the, of the sheet once. So I hope uh, we can see the uh, receptor soap sheet. I will be push, putting a little away so this basically is the assembled one and this is a continuous rotating type 
uh, sort of a reciprocal sheath. So here, what means is that the if we remove the outer sheath from the inner sheath, so this is the inner sheath. You can see that there is a there is a complicated tip of the inner sheath, and this is the outer sheath. So by just looking at the outer sheath, we can say that this is a continuous rotating type of reciprocal. So what this means is that both the inlet and the outlet are in the same sheath, which is the outer sheath. So here, what is happening is water is coming in, and then it is flowing from within the inner sheet. So if we look at the position of the water channel, if we keep both of the sheets side by side, then we will find that the water inlet falls directly above this hole on the inner sheet. So directly it goes into the inner sheet, and then from the inner sheet it comes out. And then these penetrations which are present on the outer sheet, they will take the water back in, and that will be Uh, drain through this uh, channel on the external sheet, which is the outlet channel, and separating the inner, inner channel and the outer channel, we have some. I'm not sure if you can appreciate the rubber ring there, but there's a ring which will separate the two uh, channels. Now this uh, is basically a continuous rotating sort of reciprocal sheet. I will also just briefly tell what it means. so this means that if we assemble the reciprocal uh if i keep my hands stable and my cords and camera uh, uh, the the fluid outlet uh, pipe keep moving then also my hand remain in the same plane so this can move freely and if i move my hand like this while doing the lateral lobe resection or like this when i'm doing the pipe the up, upper part of the prostate the inlet outlet pipes will not move so it becomes quite easy to kind of handle it and that's the advantage of this newly uh, adopted continuous rotating reciprocal sheet so going back at the presentation again uh, so go back at the presentation the advantage is that it gives good vision at all the time the cords don't entangle it's easier to handle but there's a disadvantage to this as well because the inner sheet does not have any uh, inlet or outlet so basically it means that if the urethra is narrower then you cannot simply use the inner sheet as a non rotating or non continuous sort of a resectoscope so you cannot perform the resection in this case if it was the older version which is the continuous non rotating sort of a resectoscope sheet then there you would still have the option of using just the inner sheet and then performing the the section by allowing water to go in and cutting and then late, uh, and later on as we used to do earlier in the older times we can kind of remove the we can kind of remove the outer uh, the chips subsequently and the water can be drained then there is the last type which is non continuous sort which is the one which we used to use previously coming on to which operator we should be using so there are various types of operators which are there so uh, in in the various types we have a standard obturator and then we have a lute obturator we have a timberlake deflecting obturator and we have the one which we are using the visual obturator which we call the schmidt's obturator so of course i would recommend using a schmidt's visual obturator because you go under vision there are no false passages there is more uh, uh safety when, when a new person is doing a sort of a resection or a cystoscopy but the problem is that since it's not very well modified and fine so the trauma would be more if you use a schmidt visual operator and there is no coding there so it is difficult to sometimes get over the angle so uh, all these we should just be knowing about them then coming on to the working element there are two type of working elements there is a passive working element which we call the nested type and then there is a the active bomb wrecker side of working element now the advantage with the passive is that when you are not uh, handling the uh, working element the loop will always remain inside the sheet so it is a safer version and usually you can also use it for a optical use sort means it's better for the beginner so if if we look into how many people are using the passive versus active i find 90% people might be using the passive working element the advantage that people claim with the active working element is that it is a little uh, faster to cut it because you're doing an active cutting so the principle behind being it a passive or an active is that in the passive uh, you have to put in the loop and then the cutting part happens passively by the spring action 
so you just leave it and slowly slowly it will come back cutting the tissue and in the active you have to use your fingers to actually try to cut the prosthetic tissue now which sheet size is recommended so basically it's difficult to say which is recommended it's a personal opinion here but of course less traumatic things are better but the problem is that then you get smaller chips the resection becomes a little lower so many people prefer the 26 french standard uh, uh, resectoscope sheet the outer sheet which we mean so there are bigger chips there's faster resection it's easy to activate there's a better vision and of course when there is a fracture it's good to have a 24 french outer sheet as well if you have that assembly you can afford two working elements and assemblies uh in the uh, cautery side there are two forms of cautery which we are very well aware of there's a bipolar cautery there's a monopolar cautery so in the bipolar cautery what is happening is the current is going from the loop to the other part of the loop or to the sheath or some other mechanism based on how the a company has constructed it so the current is not passing through the patient so it's passing from the loop to other part of the loop or to a part of the instrument which may be the sheep that's called a quasi bipolar sort of a cautery but then the advantage with bipolar is that we can use normal saline for performing the resection the cutting is by plasma so because it's normal saline being used so we feel more secure as uh, as newbies on doing a turp it we can do it for larger glands we usually are not limited by those time constraints it's a little safer there are less jerks the operator jerks are less so of course there are less, lesser chances of perforation turp syndrome is less but then if we talk about coagulation many people feel that the bipolar is not as good in coagulation because the current is not passing through the larger amount of tissue so if we use a monopolar to coagulate the current spreads through the body so it does co also cover kind of a, a better coagulation zone so even deeper structures are coagulated better that's what most many people feel and i would also kind of agree to it partially then which evacuation device should we be using so usually there are bottles so this tumi syringe is there and then elix evacuator is there so the the one that i usually use is a bottle but i have also used the tumi syringe very commonly now the advantage with the bottle is that it's easy to fill and it uses gentle pressure so you cannot put in a lot of pressure uh, through pushing a lot of fluid instantly whereas with the tumies you have to give a control pressure so you need to have a better muscle memory and more experience while irrigating with the tumies syringe uh, but the advantage of a tumie syringe is that if they are diverticular then you can direct the syringe to those places and you can have a better retrieval of the chips but because it's a glass thing it's a little more friable as well coming on to the ideal chip in the ideal chip basically it has to be a keno shaped chip and the way to cut a keno shaped chip is to cut with a predetermined end point in mind or with a predetermined starting point in mind so i'll be explaining each of these and then there's a extended cut there's a retrograde cut there's a excavating cut and there's a entrapment cut so usually what we use is a cut with a predetermined end point in mind so basically what it means is that we keep the resectoscope at a particular place we uh, do not move the resectoscope we just move the loop and then we dig in and then with movements at the thumb the wrist and at the shoulder level we make the we, we take a keno shaped chip and ultimately we lift off the resectoscope i will be demonstrating that when i shift back to the uh, live video mode then we have a cut with a predetermined starting point which means that certain places are uh, quite uh, sensitive for example the ureteric orifices and there you want to keep the starting point as fixed so that is where you make sure that the initial point is fixed and the uh, end point is may be variable you don't know where it will be going so it is often a smaller uh, it's a uh, cut which takes a longer time it's a slower cut then we have an extended cut extended cut means that we are not only moving our thumb but we are also making a movement at the shoulder level and bringing the resectoscope out so that's something which gives us a longer chip and that's called an extended cut many times we have to make a retrograde cut now this is not recommended but in certain areas around the bladder neck sometimes you may require a retrograde cut then you have an excavating cut wherein you go very deep and you don't see the loop at all but you know that the prostate tissue is there especially in the initial parts of your resection that's called an excavating cut 
and then you have an entrapment cut. So there are certain structures which would be like block blocks or papillae, and you want to kind of trap them first and then just make a small cut and remove them. So that's called an entrapment cut. This is about the chip taking. So let's understand how the movements happen during the resection. So there are three places where the movements will happen. One is at the thumb level. So this is for making the basic cut after the loop has been deployed. The second movement happens at the wrist level. So basically that's for deploying and elevating the resectoscope. And then similar movement which is happening at the wrist is also happening at the shoulder level. So many people would think, especially new residents who have not done much of PUR, they would understand that maybe the movement is just at the thumb level, but actually it's a very complicated movement which is happening while we are taking a chip. And that is the real message that I want to give in this presentation, that uh, the movement is happening both initially at the shoulder level and the wrist level. And then once you've dig in with the loop into the prostate tissue, then the thumb would kind of let the loop come out while cutting the, uh, or taking the chip. And then ultimately, again, we are gone, going to use the wrist and the shoulder to elevate the resectoscope, which I will be again showing uh, once we switch back from the slides to a live video mode. Uh, for the simple cut, we have basically are using three uh, phases, which is um, the resectoscope. And again, kind of elevate the shape chip. In the retrograde cut and in the entrapment cut, basically, we don't need the Can everybody hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you, but your uh, presentation has gone. Uh, so there are two ways in which we can take the chip. Uh, one is the scooping movement, which means that here we will not be bringing the chip to the scope. So as you can see in the diagram, before uh, the loop goes inside the sheet, we have already kind of completely cut the chip. The other is by engagement into the sheet. So basically in that what happens is that we do not elevate the scope like I, I want you to elevate the scope. But what we do is that we exploit the creation of the, uh, the, uh, the mechanics of the instrument itself to cut the sheet. So basically when the loop goes inside the sheet, it automatically by approximation cuts the chip. So the scooping is a better way because it avoids any injury to the cystoscope. So I would want that resident should try and use this method for chip taking as well. So uh, right now I would stop sharing the screen and go back to the video mode so that we can understand how the, the section is being done. So as we can see in my hand, there is this assembly. So once let's imagine that this is the, my uh, left hand is the penis and we have gone inside the urethra. Now, once we want to make a cut, what we have to do is first we bring the loop out. Then we make a movement at my wrist and shoulder. So you can see that there's this movement happening. So we dig in to the prostate tissue. Then we make a cut and we have to make a scooping cut. So we keep digging and we keep bringing the loop back. And ultimately, when we're about to end, we kind of, again, elevate the scope so that the Keno ship, ship can come. So a lot of movement is also happening at this level. That's why the urethra is quite sensitive and we have to take care of it. It's not just the movement at the thumb. The movement at the thumb is not the only movement which happens. This is not the only movement which does the resection. It's a complicated process. You bring it out, you dip it in, you remove and you keep dipping it, it in further and then you elevate it in the end to make a cano shaped chip. So this is a scooping moment which I would want uh, the residents to practice. So bring out, 
dig it in and then keep digging it in and ultimately elevate it and let the scoop come out so going back to the screen again now basically uh, when we start the process now we know that how it, the section is done what are the instruments so when we start the process it is advisable to do a cystoscopy first and then uh, we have to basically make sure that the larger sheet doesn't cause much injury so we have to start with calibrating the gear so once we do a cystoscopy we get an idea about the caliber of the urethra as well now our uh, our group of experts who have been teaching the module for TURP for the last four years we believe that otis is not a mandatory step uh, many residents have this confusion that is otis mandatory before we kind of do a resection with the resectoscope mm -hmm. if you feel that the lumen is wide enough then we don't need an otis but if we feel that there is a compromise somewhere then otis is very good and we cannot compromise an otis with a simple dilatation or forcing the scope in because once we force the scope in then we are creating an irregular injury that leads to a denser structure but as you can see in the diagram that when we use a otis the final healing is with a very fine line so i would really advise people to use otis if we feel that the urethra is not of the right caliber the position is also concerned many people make an exact lithotomy position but whereas as you can see we don't need a uh, a very tight lithotomy position in this we actually have to keep the legs a little more uh, obtuse and this allows better comfort for the patient less chances of injury to the nerves and it is comfortable for the surgeon as well which fluid to choose is quite obvious usually we use normal line if it's a bipolar if we it's a monopolar then we use glycine 1.5% now the fluid height is kept at approximately 60 cm if you keep it a little more higher then you increase the chances of absorbing this fluid so it is seen that if you make it just 70 from 60 then it increases two folds but if you increase it higher it doesn't really cause much proportional increase in the absorption so 60 is found to be the ideal height and we can follow that as much as possible coming on to dissection technique so this is a very important thing we have to plan our resection so now we know how to take the chips we know about our instrument so there are three common ways in which the resection has been advised so one was given by nesbit so nesbit said that when you want to resect you first make the uh, resection from about 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock and what happens here is that the blood supply is cut and both the lobes they would start to fall so first you make a cup a cut in the uh, in the upper part the anterior part of the prostate and then you go down from there on the left lobe or the right lobe depending on your choice usually i take the left lobe first so when you take the 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 section from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock you will feel that the lobe will start to fall and it will lose its vascularity so then what happens is then you can do some horizontal trenching movements like you can see in the diagram and you can basically cut easily without any problems and uh, you can do a little faster cutting so this is what nesbit said starting from the anterior portion and then taking one lobe and then the other and lastly doing the the posterior part which is the 6 o'clock part now barnes technique is the one which we commonly do uh, barnes technique involves cutting first the making the trench down below but because many people say that this improves the irrigation or the backflow so you get better vision so we basically first make a channel in the posterior aspect which may be from 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock again we take care of the vessels which are the arteries of bed knock and flocks and basically then we go clockwise on the right side the right lobe of the prostate and anti clockwise on the left lobe of the prostate and then we do the apical part then there is another technique suggested by alcox and flocks there they make make a cut at 3 o'clock and then they take the upper part of the lobe first and then the lower part of the left lobe and then they make a cut at 9 o'clock and they take a, a again a clockwise approach a, a pike towards the anterior part and then anti clockwise to the posterior that's how they finish this so this is these are all recognized ways of dealing with the prostate planning the resection but overall if you would see for a large gland all these techniques which resect in three phases so let's come to these three phases they are basically coning excavation and then dealing with the apical part of the process 
So basically, first what we do is we create a cone inside the prostate, like we see in this diagram. So we resect the major part of the prostatic tissue. We attack the lobe in the region of its supply, let the lobe fall down, and then we resect horizontally in a uh, in a bloodless fashion. Then we do the excavating movements, the scooping that we were talking about. They become more pronounced there because we want to kind of remove the entirety of the tissue as much as possible while taking care of not perforating the capsule. And end of the resection, when we see that majority of the gland has been removed, then we do the apical portion, which is the most advanced portion, which is something that you learn by doing many cases. In the apical portion, what happens is that your scope basically becomes, the, there's a lot of movement which is happening at the shoulder and the wrist groin as well, because you are dealing with the part which is very close to the sphincter. You take smaller bites and there's a lot of movement of the scope happening. And you can use a digital pressure also from or rectum to kind of help pronounce the apical lobes. Uh, so this is about planning the resection. Now coming to the complication. So we know that there are various places in the urethra. There are four zones which have been identified, which are most susceptible to injury, of which the most prominent is the one at the BN junction, because this is the fulcrum where most of the action is happening. Uh, so meato stenosis is one of the most common complications. It's a sub stenosis to be precise. And then there are strictures. You can perforate the bladder or it can sometimes become an interperitoneal perforation as well, very rarely. There could be extensive bleeding, which is difficult to control. You may damage the sphincter and that could lead to incontinence. There could be a bladder neck contracture if you do not remove a greater portion of the prostate at the neck region or if you use extensive contract. A coagulation around that area, then there can be TVR syndrome and infections. So my personal suggestions usually for residents who are starting the TVR is that you should divide your time when you do a prostate surgery. It is not just about giving the entire time to removing the lobes of the prostate. So you have to give an adequate time for the primary section and then you have to keep a larger amount of time for the apical resection because there you are taking smaller chips and you would want to do it safely and while preserving the sphincter, then you have to take out time in your resection for revisiting because what happens is when you are doing the prostate surgery, uh, already the fluid is flowing in and the prostatic cavity is distended. So we feel that we have removed a lot of prostate and almost entire prostate has been removed. But once we remove the chips and we go again, then we find that a lot of prostate tissue is still remaining. Uh, I will show you a diagram related to it subsequently in the next slide. Uh, so you have to give some time to revisit the resection. You have to restrict further. So I think almost half of the part uh, should be de devoted to the primary resection and apical resection and the rest half of the surgery should be divided into revisiting the resection and then making sure that the hemostasis is adequate. Now, just a word about handling, handling the vessels. So if there are large bleeders, what we have to do is that we sometimes have to coagulate just beyond the bleeder, as we can see in the diagram on the most lateral part that we do not actually close the mouth of the uh, artery sometimes if it is atheromatous it may further cause increase the bleeding so we coagulate around it then there's something called as ricochet bleeding which means that's a bounce bleeding so we feel that the blood is coming from one particular point but when we go there there's no bleeding happening it's actually happening from the other end so the spurter is so uh, powerful that is actually reflecting onto the other wall of the prostate. And we have to basically then turn our scope to the other wall, the attention to the other wall and find the bleeder there and control it. Uh, there can be sometimes a red out, which means that the artery is exactly spurting at, at the cystoscope itself, which becomes very difficult to control. So what we do is we advance the cystoscope sheet, we kind of press on that part, and then we slowly retract back. And as soon as we can see mild amount of bleeding happening, we start our coagulation right there. This is something which is very helpful for taking care of the red out or the pumpers which are facing exactly the cystoscope. And then we have venous bleeders, especially when we enter sinuses, it's difficult to control. So they are sustained coagulation for a longer period of time around the area and inside also is basically. So to prevent TUR, we can use LASIX, we can use physiological fluids, we can prevent capsular perforation by keeping the pressures low to either quantity flow or a reuters cannula and uh, 
use adequate lubrication. Basically, here we have a tip that we can use some neoprene ointment or sterile Vaseline so that because the jelly usually tends to run off. Or you can ask the assistant to keep putting the jelly in between every time, every two or three minutes so that the lubrication is better. If there are bubbles that you're facing, then you can do some dome direct drainage. You can turn the scope upside down so that the bubble flies off to the dome. And you should always avoid using pottery near the bubble. With this, I would thank everyone again for the patient listening. And over to Arun sir for the further proceedings. Thank you, Raman. Thank you for very nice presentation. You have covered not only the instruments, uh, you have covered the technique, uh, uh, movement of the instrument, uh, taking down the chips, uh, different types of uh, deep extraction from the scopes, and you have covered the complications too. A very nice presentation. It will be very useful to our postgraduates. Uh, now, uh, few questions from the chat section at the end. Uh, you recommended 24 or 26 French sectoscope for the TRP. That was a question from the chat section. So sir, as I told you, this is a very difficult question to answer. Ideally, it should be a 24 one, but because sometimes we need speed, we need bigger chips. So, so I think in the ideal situation, we should have both of them. And by judging the caliber of the Eureka, we can take a call on it. But usually most people invest into a 26 French because usually it's faster, the chips are uh, a little bigger size. Its vision is a little better for a new, newer people. It's easier to handle the process with a 26 French. That's what I feel. Any experience of TRP while keeping the SPC catheter or SPC tube? Uh, yes, there, it is very helpful, sir. But there is one uh, problem which comes with it. A little partial inflation of the bladder has to be maintained. So, uh, so otherwise there are chances of injuring the bladder somewhere here or there with electrical injury. So keep it partially inflated. So what we can do is we can either keep filling it in between and assistant can keep checking whether the, there is some partial inflation which is being maintained. Or we can partially block the uh, SPC or we can use a Reuter scanner which has a thinner lumen. So of course there the partial inflation is maintained. So it should not be a completely empty bladder also. That also causes a problem. Sometimes you, uh, residents will not be able to differentiate where they are going when the bladder is not full. Yeah. And on behalf of ISP USI, I thank you for being uh, here uh, on this Sunday morning from 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock. Um, and um, uh, I thank uh, all the faculty um, who have uh, taken pains to prepare their presentation and have been here for this uh, program. Thank you. Goodbye. Stay Thank safe. You. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Stay safe. Thanks to everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.